Welcome back to The Change Show with Simon Phillips. I'm now joined by the incredibly successful businesswoman, Lucy Turner, who has recently exited the business that she was running for 19 years to start up a new venture. So I thought, what better time to have a chat? <laughs> Just see how she's feeling about that. <laughs> Lucy, lovely to see you. How are you? How am I? I'm on fine form, Simon. Fine, fine, fine form. <laughs> so come on in. Tell us, tell us what's gone on for you recently and, and what are you up to at the moment? Very, very good question. So I, what, 2021, I think, has been a massive year of transformation for all of us, hasn't it, with, with everything that's going on in the world. But I, I kind of take transformation... Um, to the nth degree, as I do um, as a 10 polisher, which will come to shortly. But um, I've decided to make some very big transformations in my life this year, including but not limited to moving house, getting married. And as you said, deciding finally after 19 years since founding my first business to leave that business and go and do something very, very, very new with our new organisation. New organisation. Come on, stop teasing us. <laughs> tell us. Tell us about this new venture of yours. The new venture is awesome. So we are the Game Changer Collective, which is an intentionally chosen word in collective in the sense that it's a number of people coming together to form a cooperative enterprise. And the real nuance of that is that we're all kind of on the same page individually. And the fact that when we come collectively, that is very, very synergistic. So yes, the Game Changer Collective, which is going to be doing some amazing work and already is actually, but we're building up for our big, big launch um, next month, which is going to be very, very exciting. Fantastic. It's a powerful model, isn't it? Bringing together people with tons and tons of experience and then focusing them where they're required, where they can add the most value rather than thinking where can I put my six resources that I've got to go and deploy this month? Well, no one knows that better than you, do they, with the, the, the change maker group? And this, this, this is the beauty of what we're doing at the moment. It's we're able to look at what you're doing and really learn from that in terms of how do we all lean into our best energies, but how do we learn into what we what we really, really love doing, the content we, we need to be working with, the types of clients that we want to be working with. And, and the collective is just so much more, you know, evolutionary around how organisms work. You know, we've learned so much from, I mean, I could bang on forever about Lalu and his work from Reinventing Organisations, my favourite new book. Where is it? Here it is. Are we allowed to plug books? Yes, absolutely. I've got one behind me. <laughs> of course. I think everybody's got it, haven't they? But yeah. So tell us, tell us, what was that one called, Lucy? Sorry. Liz. Oh, my goodness. Reinventing organisations. So this is a chap called Lalu, um, who was a McKinsey executive who had the classic burnout and decided to go and find a different way. And he did a whole load of research looking at almost how organisations have evolved and management theories evolved, really going from kind of, you know, seeing organisations as machines to seeing organisations as families to seeing organisations as kind of ecosystems and looking at how that evolutionary process can, can really open people's eyes to doing business in a very different way. And it's what underpins, you know, we're all familiar with conscious capitalism and all that, all that good stuff. So, um, yeah, well, I can't remember how I got to this, but um, <laughs> we, we love the way that our, our collective can really take some of the fantastic principles of, of, of the most advanced forms of organisation and really not having hierarchies, really working in, um, you know, where we're self-managing, really working where we're, we're bringing our whole selves to work, which is a massive part where the GC index comes in and how we're working with that and kind of evolutionary approach to, to not trying to control too much, but to sense and respond to what's needed, both, both as our organisation and, and with our clients. But yeah, that's um, a must, must read for anyone. I've, I've just written it down. Definitely... Much, much easier, actually, to just go to the TED Talks, the Lalu TED Talks. That'll save you. Save yeah. you time. I mean, I think what that recognises is the, is the latency, if you like, at organisational levels that are usually completely ignored when it comes to making change happen, isn't it? It's usually done around the boardroom, right, this is what we're doing next. And actually what you're doing there is you're tapping into people who know how things are working today and how they could be better. And, you know, and then building it bottom up or even bottom, side, side top, everything. doesn't really matter where it comes from, does it? As long as you're tapping into the real power within your organisation, which of course is your people. 
Uh, completely. And that that's completely consistent with, with the thinking. And the, one of the analogies he uses is talking about the brain. Your brain has whatever it is, 85 billion cells. There isn't one cell that's the boss that tells everybody else what to do. The system, every cell has its role to play and just, you know, yeah. <laughs> if, if you've only got one cell like me, though, there's, there's no... <laughs> <laughs> pretty to good use haven't we <laughs> absolutely <laughs> so um you mentioned the gc index there and the chain show is sponsored by the gc index i mean phenomenal tool yeah i mean but tell me your experience with the gc index how did you find it and, and why have you decided to use it in what you're doing i think that's an absolutely brilliant question because in my 19 years of, of, of running the, the businesses that i have I've trained in pretty much every single tool going or certainly used it or clients have used it. So I think I've got a really good sense on all the tools that are out there, on the majority of tools that are out there. Someone mm. came to me in, in May and said, oh, I found this funky new tool. We have a look. And I was like, I kind of rolled my eyes and was like, yeah, sure. You know, with a, That's a another one. cynicism as to how this one's going to be different. And the tool that I probably used the most over the years would definitely be Insights Discovery, which became very, very popular in our market. And we've, we've, we've specialised in healthcare, you know, for, for a number of years now. I did the uh, profile on the Tuesday. I mm. had my debrief by the wonderful Mark Savage. So we'll give him a big shout out on the Wednesday. And by the Friday, Simon, I was experiencing behavioural change that I'd never experienced in the previous 45 years. Wow. And for me, it was so, so profound that within, you know, within weeks, I knew that it was time for me to make a real fundamental change in terms of what I was spending my day to day doing. And I've I've, I've now entered into a mission. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Mission is to make sure as many people get that aha moment that I had as possible. And I can't think of a better place working in healthcare services. There surely can't be any better place to start than than in healthcare, especially when we look at what we've all been through since, you know, the beginning of 2020. So, yeah, a profound tool, which has, you know, I don't even like calling it a tool. It's an organometric, Mm. how it helps make decisions, inform decisions for optimizing people, releasing energy, bringing creativity, helping innovation, boosting performance, increasing well-being. I mean, the list goes on and on and on with the benefits. And what we're finding just in the, the first you know, couple of months of our organization is the number of ways that it can be tailored with you know, services and solutions wrapped around it to solve so many different challenges that organizations have. But I suppose if you distill it down, there's, there's kind of a few that really seem to be bubbling up. Team effectiveness, how we move from dysfunctional to functional to really high performing teams is an obvious one. Equality, diversity and inclusion, how do we make sure people are just accepted for who they are and really can lean into their own uh, strengths and powers? And then the other one is just getting the recruitment right. You know, it, it's a real basic and, and I'm very much from the recruitment sector myself and it, it's just a really, really obvious way that we can make, re- bring real clarity to recruitment decisions, both for the company and for the, the candidate. Couldn't agree more, Lucy. Do you know what? I think for me, when I first saw it, it was so different to everything else that I'd seen and totally unexpected because I was anticipating, as you say, another profile, another personality assessment, um, you know, most of which haven't come to any sort of conclusion about me yet. But anyway, that's another story. But in terms of this one, you can, and especially with those teams that you're talking about, the team spot within minutes of looking at their the proclivities, this big posh word that we use for the energies of the different of the different styles, if you like, inside their team, they see the business gaps, they see the business problems, and all of a sudden the conversations change from one of "I'm this personality, you're that personality" to one of "That's why we don't get things done," "That's why things are never as good as they could be," or "That's why we haven't." come up with a great idea in the last three years. So, you know, it's a very business focused um, tool, organometric, as you say. And, and that, that was the thing that struck me about it. The other tools, you get to the end and it's the still the so what. Mm. The person having the, the profile and the person coaching them has to work really, really hard to get beyond that so what. It's really, really easy with the GC index as to what those next specific next actionable steps, actionable steps that are going to make a real difference are. And that's one of the things I absolutely love about it. Brilliant. So do you want to share with us then your proclivities? Where, where do you fit on the on the GC index? 
should dig out my profile, shouldn't I? So I'm I'm um, ten polisher, mm-hmm. game changer. So I um. Gosh. Sorry, what was that on the the game changer? At uh, six. So I'm definitely a harvester of these fabulous ideas, and I'm blessed because my business partner is actually a ten game changer. So actually, I spent a lot of our formative years as a ten polisher, kind of like trying to you know work in this whirlwind of all these ideas being thrown at me and feeling massively overwhelmed as a polisher hugely overwhelmed but obviously you know had we had this tool back in 2004-5 it might have made our lives a lot easier but we finally learned that you know of of Tim Tim Webster big shout out to him he'd be a great person to interview as well um you know of his 100 ideas the one or two would absolutely fly but it's how we would sift through the rest um, and so with my polish of productivity, how I would manage to not need to polish all the other 97, which would have drained all our energies. So hopefully you and Tim have got some of the more pragmatic people on the team. So <laughs> those, those people listening will, will, will um, may wonder what I'm talking about. So the game changer and polisher proclivities are very much on the obsessional side of the model whereas on the pragmatic side you've got the strategists and the implementers who can actually do something with those ideas totally and we 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 laugh but martin uh, lavoir our wonderful fd came to our business in around 2005 and it's a miracle that we actually survived the first three years to be honest but in came martin the very very incredibly strong strategist who then helped us build out the team of, of, of wonderful um, implemented project managers that brought our vision to life and and then I was able to polish it and make it its brilliant brilliant best so yeah it's a great example there of uh, the obsession and the the pragmatism coming together <laughs> fantastic so you're designing solutions you're talking to clients about it what's the sort of response you're getting as you start to um, share this with with people out there in the commercial world you know people at the front line if you like I, I cannot express how blown away I've been by the responses. And I, I shouldn't be surprised because I it's the same response I had, right? Mm. It's wonderful that people can work this out for themselves. You know, even before we do people's profiles, they're already starting to think about how it might work. The minute you share someone's profile and have that wonderful at least an hour, and I tend to find it's more like 90 minutes or two hours, that, that wonderful time to really explore and have the context overlay of what's important for them and their proclivities, you know, they're just instantly working out how this can impact them and also impact them as a whole. So lots of people are coming back to us talking about, you know, before they even think about where it's going to go at business, they're talking to their partners and their kids <laughs> and their <laughs> and brothers about them and who they are. And, uh, and that's got to be a wonderful thing. Uh, definitely. All right. So finishing off then, t- t- telling me about um, a bit more about the, the collective and the, the members of your team, who have you pulled together and how have you done that? Because that's not an easy task, presumably, of just, you know, looking around and saying to people, come and join me. Really fantastic question, Simon, because this is one of the beauties of it. It's all just evolved. So going back to the Lalu work, it's all just unraveled and become, and we are now the collective together. So first of all, it started with the guy, the guy who brought it to me in the first place, a wonderful um, Mark Clough. So big shout out to Mark. He, he'd been introduced to it. He thought it would be worth me having a look. And absolutely. So Mark is part of the collective. I was then regularly catching up with a group of wonderful ladies who at that point were running serious leadership. So big into the leadership space. Space, all of which had great depth of experience, both in pharmaceuticals, healthcare, public and private sector, one from a clinical background. So they were doing some really funky work. I'd always loved them as people and kept in touch with them. And we used to you know, meet up regularly. And I, I went onto a Zoom call just like this, probably two to three days after doing my profile. And I was, you know, pinging around the room about it and so excited. So they actually just went off and got accredited. And I was a bit like, oh, oh, hang on, I don't know how I feel about that. I thought I was going to kind of, you know, shape this and structure it and it was all going to be fine. And we just let it evolve. We had some conversations. We talked about collaboration. And then we just really came together and said, this is a collective. Let's just come together, have a collect, talk about how we play to to our strengths, best use our ideas and our skills 
and move forward. And then obviously working, I guess, behind the scenes to support the organisation will be Tim and Martin and all the rest of the team at Lockwood and Round, which is our investment company. So a wonderful collective. But for me, that's just, the, I guess, the, the, the legal sense of the collective. The collective will grow as relationships emerge as to what will enable us to bring the best value for our clients. Fantastic. So I've, having told you that was my last question, I, you've just prompted another thought, which is very rarely do we get to talk to people who are starting a business, starting a new venture. And, you know, because I think what we tend to hear in through the media is all the success stories, everything that's gone brilliantly. And so we sort of miss out on some key steps along the way. Mm. I wonder, this might be an intriguing one. What are your hopes and your fears as you start out on this journey? That's a brilliant question. My biggest hope is that we can hold on to why we've come into this in the first place, which is to do great work and have fun. Mm. So that's my absolute hope. And if we do that, we're away. Um, I also really, really hope that we continue to walk the talk. So we've got some really, we, we, we've set, you know, we've done a page on a plan, we've done all that good stuff, and we've been really clear about the way we want this to be. We've got to walk our talk of what we're trying to get our clients to do and be. So that's yeah. the biggest hope that we as a collective will hold each other to account to being true to the, those, the, the values and, and the, the aspirations for the organisation. Um, my fear is that we will become frustrated because we're selling to lots and lots of big corporates. You know, we're taking the solution to lots and lots of big corporates who individuals, I think, instantly get this and want to action it. What my fear is that we and they will be drained by how long things can take to get going. So yeah. my hope is that all our energy that we have around the GC index and leaning into our proclivities, we need to stick to that and really drive that to really help make big change in big corporates to stop people burning out, to challenge the hierarchical model, to ensure that everyone can make their biggest impact, right? Yeah. That's what this is all about and bring their, make their biggest contribution to, the, to the, their families, themselves, their roles, their, their companies, doing whatever they're passionate about. I, I, I have no fun. doubt you're going to be incredibly successful because even the biggest organisations right now are experiencing change on a level that they've never experienced before. I mean, I, I was talking to someone the other day and I was saying most organisations, most leaders in organisations, all they've really done in the last decade, maybe even two decades, is learn how to lead and manage growth. And growth isn't the number one business uh, agenda item right now it's actually change how do we yes. deal with all of the things that are changing in society as a result of COVID-19 because it's not just hybrid working there's actually aspirations and there's actually um, demands that people are making of themselves which are causing them to question everything in their life including the work they're doing for some of these huge organizations that you're talking about just talking to you today what i think would be great if we ever get the opportunity to come back and chat again simon is looking at this this great resignation this this wave of people that are just having this awakening this enlightenment that is it is time for their personal change and for them to take a different path and i think that would be wonderful to to pick up again i'm i guess i'm part of that so i i am one of those statistics <laughs> uh, but i can see all around me in my network in my friends it's just this big energy that's bubbling up which is this is time for a fundamental shift in in, in how we want to be spending our lives brilliant and i love a volunteer so i'm just marking you down to come back and <laughs> on the chain show thank you so much for coming along today and being an amazing guest i'm going to hold you to that offer of coming back and sharing with us what's it like getting this business off the ground the first few months especially in 2021 22 so i look forward to seeing you again soon fantastic thank you simon my pleasure so that was it what a wonderful guest the chain show with simon phyllis will be back again next week Look after yourself. <laughs>